The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. Lily, lingering for a moment on the corner, looked out on the afternoon spectacle of Fifth Avenue. It was a day in late April, and the sweetness of spring was in the air. It mitigated the ugliness of the long, crowded thoroughfare, blurred the gaunt roof lines, threw a mauve veil over the discouraging perspective of the side streets, and gave a touch of poetry to the delicate haze of green that marked the entrance to the park. As Lily stood there, she recognized several familiar faces in the passing carriages. The season was over, and its ruling forces had disbanded, but a few still lingered, delaying their departure for Europe, or passing through town on their return from the south. Among them was Mrs. Van Osburgh, swaying majestically in her sea spring barouche, with Mrs. Percy Grice at her side, and the new heir to the Grice millions enthroned before them on his nurse's knees. They were succeeded by Mrs. Hatch's electric Victoria. In which that lady reclined in the lonely splendor of a spring toilet obviously designed for company, and a moment or two later came Judy Trenner, accompanied by Lady Skiddaw, who had come over for her annual tarpon fishing and a dip into the street. This fleeting glimpse of her past served to emphasize the sense of aimlessness with which Lily at length turned toward home. She had nothing to do for the rest of the day, nor for the days to come. For the season was over in millinery as well as in society, and a week earlier Madame Regina had notified her that her services were no longer required. Madame Regina always reduced her staff on the first of May, and Miss Bart's attendance had of late been so irregular. She had so often been unwell and had done so little work when she came that it was only as a favor that her dismissal had hitherto been deferred. Lily did not question the justice of the decision. She was conscious of having been forgetful, awkward, and slow to learn. It was bitter to acknowledge her inferiority even to herself, but the fact had been brought home to her that as a breadwinner she could never compete with professional ability. Since she had been brought up to be ornamental, she could hardly blame herself for failing to serve any practical purpose. But the discovery put an end to her consoling sense of universal efficiency. As she turned homeward, her thoughts shrank in anticipation from the fact that there would be nothing to get up for the next morning. The luxury of lying late in bed was a pleasure belonging to the life of ease. It had no part in the utilitarian existence of the boarding house. She liked to leave her room early and to return to it as late as possible, and was walking slowly now in order to postpone the detested approach to her doorstep. But the doorstep, as she drew near it, acquired a sudden interest from the fact that it was occupied and indeed filled. By the conspicuous figure of Mr. Rosedale, whose presence seemed to take on the added amplitude from the meanness of his surroundings, the sight stirred Lily with an irresistible sense of triumph. Rosedale, a day or two after their chance meeting, had called to inquire if she had recovered from her indisposition, but since then she had not seen or heard from him, and his absence seemed to betoken a struggle to keep away, to let her pass once more out of his life. If this were the case, his return showed that the struggle had been unsuccessful, for Lily knew he was not the man to waste his time in an ineffectual sentimental dalliance. He was too busy, too practical, and above all too much preoccupied with his own advancement to indulge in such unprofitable asides. In the peacock blue parlor, with its bunches of dried pampas grass and discolored steel engravings of sentimental episodes, he looked about him with unconcealed disgust. Laying his hat distrustfully on the dusty console adorned with a Rogers statuette, Lily sat down on one of the plush and rosewood sofas, and he deposited himself in a rocking chair draped with a starched antimacassar, which scraped unpleasantly against the pink fold of skin above his collar. "My goodness, you can't go on living here!" he exclaimed. Lily smiled at his tone. "I am not sure that I can, but I have gone over my expenses very carefully." And I rather think I shall be able to manage it. Be able to manage it? That's not what I mean. It's no place for you. It's what I mean, for I have been out of work for the last week. Out of work? Out of work? What a way for you to talk! The idea of your having to work—it's preposterous. He brought out his sentences in short, violent jerks, as though they were forced up from a deep inner crater of indignation. It's a farce. A crazy farce," he repeated, his eyes fixed on the long vista of the room reflected in the blotched glass between the windows. Lily continued to meet his expostulations with a smile. "I don't know why I should regard myself as an exception," 
she began. "'Because you are. That's why. And your being in a place like this is a damnable outrage. I can't talk of it calmly.' She had, in truth, never seen him so shaken out of his usual glibness, and there was something almost moving to her in his inarticulate struggle with his emotions. He rose with a start, which left the rocking-chair quivering on its beam-ends, and placed himself squarely before her. "'Look here, Miss Lily. I'm going to Europe next week, going over to Paris and London for a couple of months, and I can't leave you like this. I can't do it. I know it's none of my business. You've let me understand that often enough. But things are worse with you now than they have ever been before, and you must see that you've got to accept help from somebody.' You spoke to me the other day about some debt to Trenner. I know what you mean, and I respect you for feeling as you do about it." A blush of surprise rose to Lily's pale face, but before she could interrupt him he had continued eagerly, "'Well, I'll lend you the money to pay Trenner, and I won't—I—see here, don't take me up till I've finished. What I mean is, it'll be a plain business arrangement, such as one man would make with another. Now what have you got to say against that?' Lily's blush deepened to a glow in which humiliation and gratitude were mingled, and both sentiments revealed themselves in the unexpected gentleness of her reply. "'Only this, that it is exactly what Gus Trenner proposed, and that I can never again be sure of understanding the plainest business arrangement.' Then, realizing that this answer contained a germ of injustice, she added even more kindly, "'Not that I don't appreciate your kindness, that I am not grateful for it. But a business arrangement between us would in any case be impossible, because I shall have no security to give when my debt to Gus Trenner has been paid." Rosedale received this statement in silence. He seemed to feel the note of finality in her voice, yet to be unable to accept it as closing the question between them. In the silence Lily had a clear perception of what was passing through his mind. Whatever perplexity he felt as to the inexorableness of her course, however little he penetrated its motive, she saw that it unmistakably tended to strengthen her hold over him. It was as though the sense in her of unexplained scruples and resistances had the same attraction as the delicacy of feature, the fastidiousness of manner, which gave her an external rarity, an air of being impossible to match. As he advanced in social experience, this uniqueness had acquired a greater value for him, as though he were a collector who had learned to distinguish minor differences of design and quality in some long-coveted object. Lily, perceiving all this, understood that he would marry her at once, on the sole condition of a reconciliation with Mrs. Dorset, and the temptation was the less easy to put aside because, little by little, circumstances were breaking down her dislike for Rosedale. The dislike, indeed, still subsisted, but it was penetrated here and there by the perception of mitigating qualities in him, of a certain gross kindliness, a rather helpless fidelity of sentiment which seemed to be struggling through the hard surface of his material ambitions. Reading his dismissal in her eyes, he held out his hand with a gesture which conveyed something of this inarticulate conflict. "'If you'd only let me, I'd set you up over them all, I'd put you where you could wipe your feet on them," he declared. And it touched her oddly to see that his new passion had not altered his old standard of values. Lily took no sleeping drops that night. She lay awake, viewing her situation in the crude light which Rosedale's visit had shed on it. In fending off the offer he was so plainly ready to renew, had she not sacrificed to one of those abstract notions of honour that might be called the conventionalities of the moral life? What debt did she owe to a social order which had condemned and banished her without trial? She had never been heard in her own defence. She was innocent of the charge on which she had been found guilty and the irregularity of her conviction might seem to justify the use of methods as irregular in recovering her lost rights. Bertha Dorset, to save herself, had not scrupled to ruin her by an open falsehood. Why should she hesitate to make private use of the facts that chance had put in her way? After all, half the opprobrium of such an act lies in the name attached to it. Call it blackmail, and it becomes unthinkable, but explain that it injures no one, and that the rights regained by it were unjustly forfeited and he must be a formalist indeed who can find no plea in its defence. The arguments pleading for it with Lily were the old unanswerable ones of the personal situation, the sense of injury, the sense of failure, the passionate craving for a fair chance against the selfish despotism of society. 
She had learned by experience that she had neither the aptitude nor the moral constancy to remake her life on new lines, to become a worker among workers, and let the world of luxury and pleasure sweep by her unregarded. She could not hold herself much to blame for this ineffectiveness, and she was perhaps less to blame than she believed. Inherited tendencies had combined with early training to make her the highly specialized product she was, an organism as helpless out of its narrow range as the sea anemone torn from the rock. She had been fashioned to adorn and delight. To what other end does nature round the rose-leaf and paint the hummingbird's breast? And was it her fault that the purely decorative mission is less easily and harmoniously fulfilled among social beings than in the world of nature? That it is apt to be hampered by material necessities or complicated by moral scruples? These last were the two antagonistic forces which fought out their battle in her breast during the long watches of the night. And when she rose the next morning she hardly knew where the victory lay. She was exhausted by the reaction of a night without sleep, coming after many nights of rest artificially obtained, and in the distorting light of fatigue the future stretched out before her, grey, interminable, and desolate. She lay late in bed, refusing the coffee and fried eggs which the friendly Irish servant thrust through her door, and hating the intimate domestic noises of the house and the cries and rumblings of the street. Her week of idleness had brought home to her with exaggerated force these small aggravations of the boarding-house world, and she yearned for that other luxurious world, whose machinery is so carefully concealed that one scene flows into another without perceptible agency. At length she rose and dressed. Since she had left Madame Regina's she had spent her days in the streets, partly to escape from the uncongenial promiscuities of the boarding-house, and partly in the hope that physical fatigue would help her to sleep. But once out of the house, she could not decide where to go, for she had avoided Gertie since her dismissal from the milliner's, and she was not sure of a welcome anywhere else. The morning was in harsh contrast to the previous day. A cold grey sky threatened rain, and a high wind drove the dust in wild spirals up and down the streets. Lily walked up Fifth Avenue toward the park, hoping to find a sheltered nook where she might sit. But the wind chilled her, and after an hour's wandering under the tossed boughs, she yielded to her increasing weariness, and took refuge in a little restaurant in Fifty-Ninth Street. She was not hungry, and had meant to go without luncheon, but she was too tired to return home, and the long perspective of white tables showed alluringly through the windows. The room was full of women and girls, all too much engaged in the rapid absorption of tea and pie to remark her entrance. A hum of shrill voices reverberated against the low ceiling, leaving Lily shut out in a little circle of silence. She felt a sudden pang of profound loneliness. She had lost the sense of time, and it seemed to her as though she had not spoken to any one for days. Her eyes sought the faces about her, craving a responsive glance, some sign of an intuition of her trouble. But the sallow, preoccupied women, with their bags and notebooks and rolls of music, were all engrossed in their own affairs and even those who sat by themselves were busy running over proof-sheets or devouring magazines between their hurried gulps of tea. Lily alone was stranded in a great waste of disoccupation. She drank several cups of the tea which was served with her portion of stewed oysters, and her brain felt clearer and livelier when she emerged once more into the street. She realized now that, as she sat in the restaurant, she had unconsciously arrived at a final decision. The discovery gave her an immediate illusion of activity. It was exhilarating to think that she had actually a reason for hurrying home. To prolong her enjoyment of the sensation she decided to walk, but the distance was so great that she found herself glancing nervously at the clocks on the way. One of the surprises of her unoccupied state was the discovery that time, when it is left to itself and no definite demands are made on it, cannot be trusted to move at any recognized pace. Usually it loiters, but just when one has come to count upon its slowness, it may suddenly break into a wild, irrational gallop. She found, however, on reaching home, that the hour was still early enough for her to sit down and rest a few minutes before putting her plan into execution. The delay did not perceptibly weaken her resolve. She was frightened, and yet stimulated by the reserved force of resolution which she felt within herself. She saw it was going to be easier, a great deal easier, than she had imagined. At five o'clock she rose, unlocked her trunk, and took out a sealed packet which she slipped into the bosom of her dress. 
Even the contact with the packet did not shake her nerves as she had half expected it would. She seemed encased in a strong armor of indifference, as though the vigorous exertion of her will had finally benumbed her finer sensibilities. She dressed herself once more for the street, locked her door, and went out. When she emerged on the pavement, the day was still high, but a threat of rain darkened the sky, and cold gusts shook the signs projecting from the basement shops along the street. She reached Fifth Avenue and began to walk slowly northward. She was sufficiently familiar with Mrs. Dorset's habits to know that she could always be found at home after five. She might not, indeed, be accessible to visitors, especially to a visitor so unwelcome, and against whom it was quite possible that she had guarded herself by special orders. But Lily had written a note which she meant to send up with her name, and which she thought would secure her admission. She had allowed herself time to walk to Mrs. Dorset's, thinking that the quick movement through the cold evening air would help to steady her nerves, but she really felt no need of being tranquillized. Her survey of the situation remained calm and unwavering. As she reached Fiftieth Street, the clouds broke abruptly, and a rush of cold rain slanted into her face. She had no umbrella, and the moisture quickly penetrated her thin spring dress. She was still half a mile from her destination, and she decided to walk across to Madison Avenue and take the electric car. As she turned into the side street, a vague memory stirred in her. The row of budding trees, the new brick and limestone house fronts, the Georgian flat houses with flower boxes on its balconies, were merged together into the setting of a familiar scene. It was down this street that she had walked with Selden, that September day two years ago. A few yards ahead was the doorway they had entered together. The recollection loosened a throng of benumbed sensations, longings, regrets, imaginings, the throbbing brood of the only spring her heart had ever known. It was strange to find herself passing his house on such an errand. She seemed suddenly to see her action as he would see it, and the fact of his own connection with it, the fact that, to attain her end, she must trade on his name, and profit by a secret of his past, chilled her blood with shame. What a long way she had travelled since the day of their first talk together! Even then her feet had been set in the path she was now following, even then she had resisted the hand he had held out. All her resentment of his fancied coldness was swept away in this overwhelming rush of recollection. Twice he had been ready to help her, to help her by loving her, as he had said, and if, the third time, he had seemed to fail her, whom but herself could she accuse? Well, that part of her life was over. She did not know why her thoughts still clung to it. But the sudden longing to see him remained. It grew to hunger as she paused on the pavement opposite his door. The street was dark and empty, swept by the rain. She had a vision of his quiet room, of the bookshelves, and the fire on the hearth. She looked up and saw a light in his window. Then she crossed the street and entered the house. End of chapter 11